I inform the House that the Right Honourable Jonathan Hunt MP, Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Parliament of New Zealand, is within the precincts. With the concurrence of honourable members, I propose to provide him with a seat on the floor of the House. Please welcome Speaker Hunt. Prime Minister, I wish to greet you. <laughs> Parliamentarians, allow me on your behalf to extend a very warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Speaker Hunt, and I would ask Speaker Hunt to convey the congratulations of this House to the New Zealand House of Representatives on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of its first sitting in Auckland, the 24th of May, 1854. I understand there were appropriate commemorations uh, to mark that particular event in Wellington last month, last week. Speaker Hunt, you are welcome. <laughs> Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that university fees have nearly doubled under this government and that student hex debts have increased from $4 billion to more than $10 billion since 1996, with a further forecast of hex, Order, debts, rising, Lindsay. hex debts rising to $15 billion over the next four years? Does the Prime Minister acknowledge that these high student debts are preventing many Australians from pursuing a higher education and delaying young graduates from buying a home and starting a family? Will the Prime Minister now adopt Labor's policy of reversing the 25 per cent fee hikes, uh, the HECS increase, and uh, also ensure that the government properly funds Australia's universities? Yeah. Member for Blair. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Member Speaker, I, I thank I thank the um, opposition leader very warmly uh, for asking me a question about higher education. Uh, I understand, Mr. Speaker, that um, the title of the uh, Labor Party's uh, education policy, higher education policy, in in this country is aim higher. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, well, I'm going to take um, a copy of that policy with me when I call on the British Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, in the next few days, and I'm going to compare the title, Mr Speaker, because I think, purely by accident, it's the same. It's aim higher, Mr Speaker. Uh, no, I mean, it is purely accidental. It wouldn't be deliberate because there's no similarity between the policy substance, Mr Speaker. On this occasion, the only thing the Leader of the Opposition plagiarised was the title. He didn't plagiarise the substance because the reality is that the third way Tony Blair approach to higher education is essentially the same as the approach of this government and indeed the same as the approach that Labor adopted when Labor was last in office, Mr Speaker. The introduction of Hex, supported at the time by the coalition because we recognised, as Labor did then, that you could no longer hold out to the Australian public the essentially fraudulent proposition that tertiary education could be free, Mr Speaker. That had been tried by the Whitlam government. We all remember the Whitlam government, Mr Speaker, and uh, it had been proved um, a, uh, an expensive uh, failure, Mr Speaker. What I can confirm are a number of facts, Mr Speaker. I can confirm, I can confirm Mr Speaker, that uh, when all Treasurer. the government's changes when all of the government's changes are fully operational, uh, the Member total Thorne contribution Melbourne. of a student through HEX of an average degree will be 28 per cent, Mr Speaker. In other words, 72 per cent of the cost is being borne by the general community. 28 per cent is being borne by the student. I can confirm that from 1 July 2004, the minimum HEX repayment threshold will increase to $35,000, Mr Speaker. In other words, until you earn $35,000, you don't have to start paying back the 28 per cent of the cost of the degree, Mr Speaker. And I can also inform the House that in 2002, less than 1 per cent of all domestic undergraduates were in full-fee courses costing more than $50,000, Mr Speaker. Our changes have provided opportunity 
and flexibility for the universities. Our changes have got more money into universities. Our changes balance the interests and rights of students against the interests and rights of taxpayers, Mr Speaker. And instead of railing against the sensible changes that we have introduced, I would invite the Leader of the Opposition to rail against the scandalous obscene increases in TAFE charges that have been introduced by Labor governments around Australia. In some cases, three and four hundred per cent, Mr Speaker. But do you hear a word from the Leader of the Opposition, the member for Wera? Oh no, you don't criticise Bob Carr or Peter Beattie because they belong to the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. But just as in relation to Iraq, the Leader of the Opposition uh, delights in, in criticising George Bush, but he never utters a word of criticism of Tony Blair. The Honourable Member for Petrie. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Is the Minister aware of any statements that Australia's strong relationship with the United States puts us at a disadvantage internationally? Are there any other views? The Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, well, Mr Speaker, first of all, can I thank the honourable member for her question um, and say that actually I am aware of views being expressed by some of those opposite and other people in the community which suggest that Australia shouldn't have a very close relationship with the United States, but amongst other explanations for that is that it damages our relations with Asia. Um, Mr Speaker, let the House be absolutely clear of the government's view. At a time of great international uncertainty, Australia's close relationship with the United States is vital to our security. And the United States' engagement in the security architecture of the Asia-Pacific region is vital to the stability of the Asia-Pacific region. And one of the great myths being pushed by the opposition is that we should downgrade our relationship with, with the United States in order to upgrade our relations with Asia. I mean, our strong relationship with Asia is there for all to see. Free trade agreements with Thailand and Singapore. Interestingly enough, the Labor Party has chosen not to criticise those free trade agreements. Um, su the support of the ASEAN economic ministers for the creation of Australia and New Zealand free trade area and uh, the offer from the ASEAN economic ministers that, to the Australian and New Zealand prime ministers to attend an ASEAN summit meeting later this year, a trade and economic framework agreement with China, including a joint study now being undertaken on the feasibility of a free trade agreement. We're able to do all of these things and have a close relationship with the United States. Um, the other myth, of course, that's pu pushed by the opposition is that somehow um, the fact that Australia has troops in Iraq damages us in Asia. If I may say so, Mr Speaker, this just demonstrates a complete failure to understand Asia and a complete lack of knowledge of Asia. The fact is that a number of Asian countries join Australia in having troops in Iraq. Thailand, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, the Philippines. And indeed, uh, in the presence of the Speaker of the New Zealand House of Representatives, let me remind the House that New Zealand has troops in, uh, in Iraq, and they, uh, Mr. Speaker, are very welcome there. The truth is that our alliance with the United States strengthens Australia in Asia. It doesn't weaken Australia in Asia. Now, Mr. Speaker, of course we don't agree with the Americans on everything. We have been um, aggressively arguing our case with the Americans on the issue of farm subsidies. We have taken a different course from the United States on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, we have signed the Statute of the International Criminal Court. But you see, Mr Speaker, the Labor Party, um, under the current leader of the opposition, continually attacks the United States on absolutely everything. They are opposed to the United States policy on missile defence. They are opposed to the Proliferation Security Initiative. They are opposed to the Free Trade Agreement. They are opposed to us being involved in trying to bring stability and democracy to Iraq. They are opposed to anything to do with the United States. I notice, Mr Speaker, that in a speech on 27 May to the Sydney Institute, the member for Griffith said that um, Labor's views on negotiating an arrangement with the Americans on the International Criminal Court which is called an Article 98.2 agreement, was, and I quote, unacceptable in the extreme. 
because it would er render, and I quote the member for Griffith, Americans guilty of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions immune from prosecution in Australia. Mr Speaker, that statement by the member for Griffith, who is always ready to accuse others of being dishonest and lying, that statement is completely untrue and it is utterly misleading for the member for, for, the member for Griffith to say that Americans under an Article 98 agreement would have immunity from prosecution in Australia is false. Americans enjoy no immunity from prosecution in Australia now, nor would they under an Article 98-2 agreement. Any agreement that we concluded would be consistent with our international criminal court obligations and it would allow us to try US citizens in Australian courts for war crimes or any other types of crimes against Australian law. Mr Speaker, the member for Griffith has gone out and deliberately misled the Australian people in order to promote Labor's anti-American agenda, which of course is the leader of the opposition's agenda. Now he doesn't like to hear it. He, he's asked Minister for a point for of order affairs. to be raised. Minister for foreign but affairs. he doesn't like to be reminded of his visceral anti-American. Minister for Foreign Affairs will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Lawler, Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, Mr Speaker, that was clearly an allegation that the member for Griffiths deliberately misled. As you are well aware, as everybody in this House is aware, that's beyond the standing orders. It's an unparliamentary remark. It should be withdrawn or proceeded with on substantive motion. Let me point out to the member for Lawler that while I found the statement one that I wouldn't use myself, it is in fact not outside the standing orders. The Minister for Foreign Affairs did not say that the, the Minister for Foreign Affairs did not say that the Minister had deliberately misled the Parliament, which was the point that I believe the member for Lawler was seeking to make. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. There's no doubt about it though, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party, including the Leader of the Opposition, will get up here and particularly go out into the Australian community and accuse the government of lying over any manner of things. And that's your standard. But when it comes to them being criticised for making statements which are manifestly untrue, apparently they'd rather have silence. You'd rather shut everybody up when they expose the uh, weakness of your own arguments. Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, this anti-Americanism in the end isn't going to wash with the Australian public. The Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Does the minister stand by the figures he tabled in the parliament on the 26th of May, which show university students in Queensland will pay $100 million more in fees over the next four years because of the Howard government 25 per cent hex hike? Order. And if, Jagger, so, Jagger has a call. and if so, how does the minister explain why his department is today reported in the Courier Mail? saying university students in Queensland will actually pay an extra $180 million—80 million more than the figure he tabled in the parliament last week. Minister, why has the hex debt of university students in Queensland increased by $80 million in six days? The mi minister, member for O'Connor. The Minister for Education, Science and Training. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, mean, I thank the member for uh, Jagger Jagger for her uh, question. Uh, uh, last week, Mr. Speaker, honourable members will recall that I advised the House that under the government's higher education reforms, that in addition to $1.8 billion of taxpayers' money being invested in universities over the next four years, that my department's initial analysis was that at that time, that, that is last week, that the 17 Order. That the 17 Jager, universities Jager that had question. decided to increase HECS by from 5 to 25 per cent, that those universities would expect to receive $377 million in additional revenue over the next four years. In fact, my department has spent the, uh, the last uh, week, in fact, further analysing this information. And when the department actually takes into account the students who are currently in the system who are not affected by this, in fact, today, with 18 universities having decided to increase HEX, eight of, them not, eight of them deciding not to increase HEX at all, and 13 yet to decide, 
that in fact a total of $662 million of additional money will go into universities over the next four years as a result of these government's policies. What that means, Mr Speaker, is Member that for every Ganga, Ganga extra dollar that the students invest, not as students but once they have graduated and, as the Prime Minister said, they're working and earning in excess of $35,000 a year, the taxpayer will have invested an extra $3, Mr Speaker, and every last dollar of hex, of course, goes to university to actually benefit the education of the students. The taxpayer pays it up front and then the graduate pays back just over a quarter of the cost of his or her university once they have actually graduated. And, uh, Mr Speaker, it's interesting that uh, the Labor Party has said through the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that it will fully compensate the universities for this $662 million. In fact, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said to uh, Brian Tui on Meet the Press on the 18th of April this year that it was in the policy that, in fact, it is in the Labor Party's policy. And in fact, today, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is saying to the Courier-Mail, and she's quoted in the Courier-Mail as saying, and I quote, Ms Macklin said universities would be fully compensated for losing the hex rises through indexation and through Labor's $450 million University of the 21st Century Fund. So, Mr Minister Speaker, for small business. I go to the Labor Party's policy and I go to page 25, costings. Costings of the Labor Party's policy. Now, the Labor Party says that its policy is costed at $2.34 billion over the first four years. So today, before 13 universities have made a decision about HECS in the next four years, today we are looking for $662 million. So the line in the Labor Party policy says oppose HECS increases $15 million. Well, in fact, the Labor Party that day, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition issued a media release and said that, in fact, that had nothing to do with compensating for HECS increases. So today in the Courier Mail we are told that in fact this $662 million is going to be found from indexation. So indexation in the Labor Party policy, $312 million. Now that's a long way short of the $662 million. So the $312 million, that goes out of the policy. I'll give that to the Treasurer. So the Labor Party's $2.34 billion minus $312 million. So they've got $312 million from indexation that apparently is going to fund the compensation to the universities. So then they say $450 million is going to come from this uh, university of the 21st century. So that's 80 per cent of their policy has gone in compensating universities. I'll give that to the Treasurer. <laughs> so what that means, Mr Speaker, that the Labor Party, before it even starts funding universities, We'll have to find $662 million to fully compensate universities, which brings them back to a $1.6 billion policy, and the Minister for Finance and the Department of Finance has already found a $370 million hole in Labor's policy. So what that means, Mr Speaker, over the next four years, Australian Minister, universities will Minister. receive— Member for Jagger Jagger waving her hand won't simply prevent me from making the point that I had already reminded her of her obligations under the standing order. The minister has the call. So what that means, Mr. Speaker, is that over the next four years, Australian universities will receive $2.4 billion from this government as a result of the policies of this government. They will receive $1.3 billion from the Australian Labor Party, and the leader of the opposition. If he is incapable of funding a higher education policy and costing it, how on earth is he going to run Australia? The Honourable Member for Boothby. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House of the international reaction to Australia's leading efforts on tobacco control? Is the Minister aware? <laughs> Is the minister aware? Member for Grindler. Is the minister Order. aware? Order. Is the minister aware? The of member for Boothby. The member for Boothby is entitled to ask his question and to be heard. He has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is addressed to the minister for Foreign Affairs. 
Would the minister inform the House of the international reaction to Australia's leading efforts on tobacco control? Is the minister aware of any alternative views? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Indeed. Mr Speaker, I thank the um, Honourable Member for Boothby for his question. Now, members may not know the Honourable Member for Boothby is a doctor, a medical doctor, and so it's not surprising he would ask a question about uh, international reaction to Australia's leading efforts on tobacco control. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Leader of the Opposition asked a question about anti-smoking. Um, it seemed to me, Mr Speaker, that that, that question rather indicated the Leader of the Opposition had no idea what Australia had been doing in terms of anti-smoking campaigns and what the international community thought of our campaigns. The World Health Organisation put out a press release a few years ago saying a major factor in Australia's second highest life expectancy rates was that, and I quote, smoking rates have dropped sharply, sharply from their earlier peaks. And the World Health Organisation estimates that the prevalence late rates of smoking in Australia are 19.5 per cent, compared to Germany 34.5 per cent, France 27 per cent, Canada 21.7 per cent, uh, New Zealand 24.9 per cent. Uh, too much smoking still going on in New Zealand. And, um, Mr. Speaker, um, the United States of America. The United States of America is a very important country in all of this. 23.3 per cent. It's so higher in the United States of America than Australia. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, Australia also, as the World Health Organisation said a couple of years ago, is a proven leader in tobacco within the Western Pacific region. It said um, also that in 1997, Australia's national tobacco campaign was launched. This sustained, coordinated national activity has been successful. Now listen to this. This is what the World Health Organization says, Mr Speaker. Uh, components of the campaign have been used by Canada, by New Zealand, by Singapore, the United Kingdom and the United States of America. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, I mention the United States of America because I went back to my office and wondered why the Leader of the Opposition yesterday had asked a question about smoking. And I found out why. Because the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker, and I was asked for alternative views. The Leader of the Opposition has a handbook on which all these kind of so-called soft questions are based. And this is it. I brought it in with me. It's called Winning the Presidency in the 90s Behind the Oval Office by Dick Morris, <laughs> President Clinton's Chief Strategist. Now, Mr Speaker, an interesting book to read. I commend it to all members of the House. I look for the price. This version comes from the DFAT Library. It doesn't have a price on it, but <laughs> taxpayers must have paid for this one. But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on page 217, Dick says in his advice, in his explanation for how President Clinton's campaign should be run, tobacco would be our first effort. Page 215, on tobacco I was a zealot. I fought hard to extend the values and agenda, of course, of President Clinton, to include a ban on advertising. That's page 215. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say that the story doesn't stop there. Um, on page 230 of this book, Dick uh, Morris says that um, a good strategy was to introduce a curfew for teenagers. Sound familiar to anyone? The question about the curfew for teenagers. Page 200 and page, uh, sorry, page 38. The treasurer will be interested in this. Page 38. Let's cut government programs. Page 81. Propose a tax cut. But the granddaddy of them all, Mr. Speaker, is page 231 where Dick, uh, yes, Dick Morris called for a massive program to ensure that children could read. Interesting. Funny coincidence, Mr Speaker, that from smoking to almost anything else, the leader of the opposition strategy can be found in this book. There's the, the final chapter of this book, Mr Speaker, is the chapter I suggest the leader of the opposition might choose to read as well. And that chapter is called Downfall. And I think you might find that an excellent Minister. chapter. When the House has come to order, the Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Has the minister seen a discussion paper prepared by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ballarat for its council dated the 22nd of April 2004, which states, and I quote, that with a change of government there yeah. will be a massive injection of new funding, which would obviate the need for any increases to HEX? Oh. Minister, isn't the author of this paper, Professor Cox, a man the minister claims to admire, right that students would not be facing a 25 per cent fee hike if the Howard government properly indexed university grants? Will the minister adopt Labor's policy to properly index university funding and reverse the Howard government's 25 per cent fee hike? Before I call the minister, I'd point out to the member for Jagger Jagger that the authenticity of the question was not influenced by the inclusion of the professor's name. The Minister for Education, Science and Training. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'd firstly point out to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that the University of Ballarat will receive a minimum $6.8 million in core funding as a result of this government's uh, higher education reforms before it accesses any of the performance-based funding pools as a part of the uh, $2.6 billion five-year program. I'd also uh, say to the member for Ballarat, in fact, that uh, she and every member on the other side voted against that. I'll also be making sure that the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ballarat is fully aware of the consequences of Labor Party's policy, member which is a Ballarat. $1 billion deficit in funding, which is underfunded, where the Labor Party has been advising universities that they will be fully compensated for at least $662 million for hex changes over the next four years, at the same time as deceiving the Australian taxpayer into believing that the policy is fully funded. I might also take this opportunity to remind the House Mr. Speaker, that hex is a, a system where the student, not as a student but once the student has graduated, pays back his or her 25 per cent share of the cost of their education through the tax system. The Australian taxpayer, the vast majority of whom have never seen the inside of a university, will continue to pay for almost three quarters of the cost of university education. And it also ought to be, the House ought to be reminded that the average hex debt in Australia at the moment is eight and a half thousand dollars. Ninety per cent of those people who owe the taxpayer money for hex owe less than eighteen thousand dollars. A university graduate has a lifetime unemployment rate Member of a quarter of that that hasn't been to university. And in their very first year of graduation, even after all of these changes, even after all of these changes, in their very first year of graduating, in every single case, with the exception of law, the university graduate will earn more in his or her first year of working than their entire hex debt could possibly be under these changes. And as the uh, British Prime Minister said, it is free at the point of entry, it's fair at the point of repayment, and every last dollar goes to the university to benefit the education of those students. The Honourable Member for Eden Monero. Mr Speaker, uh, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Uh, would the Treasurer inform the House what families should do to prepare for benefits that are set to be delivered? Does the Treasurer have any suggestions to families on how to maximise their benefits? Are there any threats to these benefits being delivered? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Eden Monero for his question, and I welcome the uh, interest that he shows in family policy. Uh, because, uh, as far as uh, the government is concerned, families are the building block of our society, and we want to make sure that they're kept strong, Mr. Speaker. Now, he, uh, he asked me what people could do to ensure that they get their uh, benefits, and uh, there will be an additional $600 per child paid before the 30th of June this month Mr. Speaker, to all of those families which are eligible for the Family Tax Benefit Part A. If there are families that are worried that uh, they haven't received it yet uh, and we're not expecting it to be paid until about the middle of the month, they call the, call the fax phone number on uh, 136150. Mr. Speaker, they could access the website or uh, if they have any doubt uh, about their entitlement, they could uh, ring their local federal MP. Uh, 
to uh, find out about uh, their uh, their benefits, Mr. Speaker. Order. Or in uh, in Labor electorates, they could uh, ring coalition senators uh, to make sure that they were uh, properly informed as to their entitlements. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, because uh, because Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure that there'd be any point in ringing the local. Labor MP, because the Labor Party seems to be so opposed Member to these additional Braddon. benefits. Uh, can you imagine if you rang up uh, in the electorate of, uh, of Braddon, Mr Speaker, uh, to ask about the benefits of a coalition uh, budget? You'd get a harangue on the other end of the phone, but you wouldn't get much information. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, can I say uh, that uh, it is not just $600 per child that uh, families can be receiving, because the increase is an additional $600 per child Treasurer, per annum. Treasurer, resume his seat. A great deal of tolerance was extended to the member for Braddon because the Treasurer had in fact engaged him in the answer. Persistent interjection will be dealt with. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, but the government of course has also changed uh, eligibility for family tax uh, benefit um, in respect of the income test and the taper test. And I do ask the, the House to follow me in relation to this. Um, a family where the, uh, the father is on uh, 40,000, uh, about uh, average um, earnings, uh, Mr. Speaker, where the mother is working part time with an income of around 10,000, and with two children, one under five, on an annual basis they would receive an additional $1,200 per annum, that's 600 per child. Mr Speaker, because of the changes in the taper rate, they would get an additional $965 under family tax benefit A, and because of the changes in the taper rate for family tax benefit B, they would get an additional $1,252. That family, uh, starting, Mr Speaker, from 1 July, uh, well, that family, Mr Speaker, when all of these uh, entitlements are introduced in full, would be entitled to an additional $3,417 per year. They are the benefits that are delivered to uh, that family. And, Mr. Speaker, as, as many of us know, uh, it's becoming much more common for uh, mothers with young children to go back into the workforce on a part-time basis. Uh, our changes to the Family Tax Benefit Part B will encourage that. And uh, that cameo of a family would be better off by $3,417 per year. Now let me say, in addition to this, this government wants to introduce a superannuation co-contribution, so that if that family were to make payments, uh, and both the father and the mother could make payments into superannuation, they would get 150 per cent of the contribution that they make. Now, Mr. Speaker, why would any political party oppose such a policy? What, why, why is the Australian Treasurer Labor Party, Mr. To the Speaker? Question opposing a proposal which would give a family like that an additional benefit of 150 per cent of any money that they contribute to superannuation. Mr Speaker, it's one thing to say that you want to support families that are earning thirty or forty thousand dollars, but when it comes to votes in this parliament, if that were in fact your position, Mr Speaker, why would you vote down a co-contribution scheme? And yet uh, I don't know that it's dawned on the Labor Party backbench following the member for Werriwer, they are voting down a superannuation co-contribution to those families. They are opposing the superannuation co-contribution, Mr Speaker. The Australian Labor Party is opposing, is opposing a 150 per cent proposal low income for low-income earners in relation to superannuation contribution. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, as, the, as the Foreign Minister says, it's not in the Dick Morris book. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, but what other reason could there be for taking such a position? Now, Mr. Speaker, I was then asked this question: What can families do to guarantee they keep their entitlements? And I want to make this point: that the Australian Labor Party has not agreed to keep the benefits which the government has introduced under family tax benefits. They have said that they will vote them through, and the Australian Labor Party has said they will apply in 2004-2005, but the Australian Labor Party does not guarantee those benefits thereafter. And that has been made entirely clear by the member for Fraser. 
and indeed made clear by the member for Kingston, who said that this money was not quarantined. They were his words, not quarantined, Mr. Speaker, with the intention that they could be taken back. Now, why would the Australian Labor Party want to take these benefits back? Well, it's also obvious. The Australian Labor Party has made a number of unfunded promises which can't be paid for. The Australian Labor Party says that it's going to introduce new tax cuts for everybody, and we await with bated breath to see the dimension of those tax cuts. The Australian Labor Party also says it's going to spend more in various areas of government expenditure. And the Australian Labor Party says after taxing less and spending more, they're going to have more left over at the end of it. Mm. So, Mr Speaker, that's why they are enviously eyeing these family tax benefits. And I just want to say to that family, 40000 with mum earning 10000 in part-time work, that additional benefit of $3,417 is under threat from a Labor election victory. Now, Mr Speaker, until such time as the Australian Labor Party can announce a policy and it runs from scrutiny, here we are, the Leader of the Opposition running the small target strategy. That's what he essentially is doing, the small target strategy. He won't put out any tax policies or any family policies or any funding policies, Mr Speaker. He's trying to run this small target strategy, the strategy which he himself decried, because he's hoping that the media won't put him under any scrutiny. Treasurer. Well, we say this, Mr Speaker, the Australian Labor Party is entitled to take away those family tax benefits and it is entitled to take away those tax cuts, just like it is trying to take away those superannuation benefits, but only on the basis that it comes clean before the election. It is only entitled to do that if it is honest with the Australian people before the election, Mr Speaker. And that's why the Leader of the Opposition will come under increasing media scrutiny over the weeks which are ahead, because he knows these promises of all things to all men and women cannot be delivered, and the Australian public demand to know the truth. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Given that Major O'Kane's end of tour report of 9 February was tabled in Senate estimates this morning, detailing the central role of Australian defence lawyers in investigating allegations of Iraqi prisoner abuse, and that this report was submitted to the defence chain of command, does the Prime Minister now concede that Australian government officials knew about the Iraqi prison atrocities much earlier than April? Given that the government has provided misleading advice to both Parliament and the Senate estimates, Will the Prime Minister now set out a full account of when the government and its officials knew of these atrocities and what action they took? Prime, Honourable the Prime Minister. I've already indicated that um, there were uh, reports uh, <coughs> sent through uh, to uh, uh, officials in departments in Canberra from Iraq prior to April. But what I have said before and what I repeat uh, Mr Speaker, is that uh, I, as Prime Minister, and as I understand it, relevant ministers as ministers, uh, were not um, aware or conscious of the serious uh, criminal abuses which have been exemplified and typified by the publication of those photographs until April, Mr Speaker. Can I take the opportunity of uh, saying also to the House that all the comments that I've made on this matter have been based on advice I have received from the Department of Defence. Mr. Speaker, I, I do not have direct personal Lowe. knowledge, and nor could anybody reasonably expect me, Mr. Speaker, to have had direct personal knowledge. I might also, Member for Ballarat. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, in, in just on the question, just on the question of knowledge, Mr. Speaker, could I make this point? I visited um, ba Baghdad on the 25th of April, Mr. Speaker. On the 25th of April. I met when I was in Baghdad not only the commanding officer of the Australian Defence Forces in the Iraqi region, but I also met uh, the, uh, the head of the Coalition Provisional Authority, Mr Bremer. I met the CENTCOM commander, General Abizade, and I met General Ricardo Sanchez, and I spoke to a large number of Australian defence personnel. I was accompanied by a number of journalists, Mr Speaker, there was no mention to me by anybody of the prisoner abuse issue. And this was on the 25th of April, Mr Speaker. Now, I would have thought, Mr Speaker, 
that if that if, that that if knowledge of this matter were around, Mr. Speaker, beyond um, a very very small number of people, and I'm talking here of the Australian side, Mr. Speaker, I would have thought that if the Americans regarded this as something that in any way involved the Australians, Mr. Speaker, then the, the matter would have been raised uh, with me by General Abizade or General Sanchez, Mr. Speaker, but it wasn't. And I think that goes to question, Mr. Speaker, it goes to the issue of my the state of knowledge Falingiari. Uh, on the 25th of April, and is certainly consistent with the assertion, Mr. Speaker, uh, that I've made. I did indicate, Mr. Speaker, in the House yesterday that the Defence Department had in its possession, and I, I say this for the purposes of completeness of that answer yesterday, Mr. Speaker, had in its possession some documents described as working drafts or working papers. I've now been briefed on these papers and I'm told by the Defence Department that the working papers of October-November last year do indeed cover advice previously given to me by the Department, that is that they are largely a discussion of prison conditions and possibilities for improvement or amelioration. However, I have now been told that the documents also canvassed allegations of unacceptable treatment of prisoners. Mr. Speaker. I have been informed by the Defence Department that these documents were handed over by Major O'Kane to the Department on the 11th of May, although one had been with the Department since February, and that their content was considered systematically by the Department for the first time over the last few days. They were then drawn to Senator Hill's attention over the weekend, and then, as indicated to my attention, Mr Speaker, as the House will know, these matters are still before the Senate Estimates Committee. However, and this goes very directly to the point asked by the Leader of the Opposition, Member I have asked Senator Wills. Hill, when the Senate meets again, he is the responsible minister, the Defence Minister, to make a full statement to the Senate on this issue, uh, canvassing both the chronology and the substance of contact between ADF personnel the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq, the ICRC Member for and Smith. the extent and timing of communication of the details of such contact to officials of the government in Australia. Mr. The Member Speaker, for is it remains the case Mr. Speaker, that all statements that I have made on this issue have been based on advice from the Department of Defence. Mr. Speaker. All statements have been based on that advice. Mr Speaker, and most importantly of all, Mr Speaker, Member for Watson. It, should, it should be emphasised again that at no stage did Australia hold prisoners in Iraq. Mr Speaker, let me say that again. At no stage did Australia hold prisoners in Iraq. There has been no suggestion of any Australian involvement in prisoner abuse. And any implication to that effect, Mr. Speaker, should be totally rejected. It seems that simply warning the member for Ballarat never achieves anything at all. Should she persist, I'll have no occasion but to deal with her under Standing Order 303. 303. The Honourable Member for Fairfax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my Fairfax. question is addressed to the Attorney General. The member for Fairfax has the call and cannot be heard. Member for Fairfax. Thank you. Would the Attorney General advise the House whether David Hicks or Mamdu Habib can be returned to Australia to face criminal charges? The Honourable the Attorney General. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, and let me just make it clear that Mr Hicks and Mr Abib are alleged to have undergone training with Al Qaeda, amongst other matters. Um, and any person, any person, any Australian who receives such training, now faces criminal penalties under the Commonwealth Counter Terrorism Order. Laws enacted in 2002. And uh, the same argument applies in relation to the application of international law. The fact remains that prosecuting someone for an act that at the time constituted an offence under international law but is not Australia's law, regardless of how you present it, if uh, an enactment was to now make it unlawful, 
would be retrospective. The government has made its position clear that Australia's terrorism offences will not operate retrospectively. Uh, the opposition, Mr Speaker, on the other hand, is not uh, quite as sure about its own position on these matters. In fact, over the weekend, on uh, separate interviews given by the Leader of the Opposition and the member for Jellybrand, uh, it was quite clear that there were conflicting views. The Leader of the Opposition was quoted as saying, uh, we have, and I quote, we have argued consistently Order. that justice should be dispensed— Order. The Attorney General, the member for Wills on a point of order, I presume. Yes, Mr Speaker. Understanding Order 145, the member for Fairfax asked whether Mr Hicks or Mr Habib can be returned to Australia to face criminal charges. I'd suggest to you that he's now straying from the question he was asked. The Attorney General, I did note the question. The Attorney General will refer to the return of Mrs Hicks and Habib to Australia and the legality of it. Yes, well, Mr, Mr. Speaker, I'm dealing with uh, the context in relation to this matter because there are arguments, there are arguments by some uh, that uh, justice should be dispensed in Australia because they're Australian citizens and by others who have said that there are some limits to our law. And this is the member for Jellybrand. I think she dealt with this issue uh, quite admirably because she said, I don't think it is impossible to apply international laws here, but it would require a bit of unusual legislation being introduced to do it. And she goes on to say, I'm not sure that there is an argument for us to do that yet. Now, the opposition needs to state its position clearly in relation to this matter, Mr. 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 Speaker. Member for um, the opposition needs to state its position clearly in relation to these Minister matters. Minister because Order. The member for Jellybrand not only persistently interjects, but interjects after I have drawn her attention to her obligations. The Attorney General has the call. Speaker, I, I just make this point again that the opposition needs to state clearly whether it supports retrospective criminal laws or whether it is, as the Shadow Minister suggested, a little too difficult. Um, but the government is very clear in relation to this matter. Our view is that Mr Hicks and Mr Habib should be made to stand accountable for their actions before a proper authority. And in this case, the US military commissions established for this purpose. And our view is that that should be occurring as expeditiously as possible. And it's why the Prime Minister has made very frequent representations to ensure that that has occurred. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Speaker, thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that yesterday in Senate estimates, when asked about the activities and knowledge of Major O'Kane, senior defence officials could not answer on at least 32 occasions before dinner time when questioned about the allegations of serious abuse of Iraqi prisoners? Prime Minister, doesn't the inability of senior officials to answer these questions demonstrate the need for Major O'Kane, the military officer who visited the Abu Ghraib prison on at least five occasions and who played a central role in coordinating the Red Cross investigations of these allegations of serious abuse to appear and give evidence before the Senate? Will the Prime Minister now direct the Minister for Defence to allow Major O'Kane to appear at Senate estimates? Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the answer to the question is no, but it does indicate the desirability of the detailed statement that I've asked Senator Hill to make to the Senate when it meets. Member for Hotham. Member for Prospect. The Honourable Member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer inform the House of the economic data released today, and what do these results indicate about the importance of consistent economic management? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Riverina uh, for her question and uh, acknowledge the work that she does on behalf of uh, the electorate of Riverina. Uh, can I inform her that today's uh, balance of payments uh, figures for the uh, March quarter were uh, released. 
showing that the current account widened to $12 billion, or 6.1 per cent of GDP. Uh, this was driven by an increase in the trade deficit, which in turn was driven by strong growth in imports. Uh, imports increased 7 per cent in the March quarter and 16.6 per cent over the year. Mr. Speaker, that's consistent with a strongly growing domestic economy. Uh, export volumes for the quarter rose 2.2 per cent. That is, they increased, but they did not increase by as much as the import figures, with rural goods uh, rising a strong 13 per cent in the March quarter. And, Mr Speaker, uh, that was primarily due to a strong rise in the export of cereal grains. Uh, grain exports have more than doubled over the year, uh, reflecting uh, uh, last year's wheat crop uh, and some recovery from the drought, although, Mr Speaker, we would be uh, foolish if we were to think that uh, the effects of the drought have uh, fully worked through or that the drought has broken. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, what these figures suggest is that net exports will subtract 1.3 per cent uh, from March quarter GDP growth. Uh, and Mr Speaker, we have forecast, uh, however, that uh, as the domestic economy cools somewhat and the world economy picks up somewhat, that the position in relation to the balance of payments will improve, i.e. Australia will uh, not be bringing in uh, the ex import rise uh, that it has in the last year and that markets for our exports will increase over the course of the year. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, net foreign debt in the March quarter was at 47.9 per cent of GDP. Uh, the statistician has released a news release uh, just uh, in the last uh, minutes indicating that the percentage figures in Table 33 in the, uh, the actual publication are wrong, uh, and he has uh, revised uh, those figures, Mr Speaker, uh, down to 47.9, which is lower than it was uh, as a proportion of GDP in uh, December of 2002 and March 2003. So, in proportionate terms, net foreign debt uh, has declined. Uh, retail trade, which was released today, Mr Speaker, shows that uh, uh, the value of retail trade was unchanged in the month, but 7.4 per cent higher over the course of the year. Uh, and combined with the easing of activity in the housing sector, uh, this is uh, consistent with slowing of domestic demand. Mr Speaker, uh, these figures, 6.1 uh, per cent of GDP uh, on the current account, Mr Speaker, are uh, not, certainly not the worst current account that Australia has had, but we don't want to be complacent about it. Uh, the current account uh, deficit is high. As I said in earlier, uh, we are forecasting over the course of the year with demand slowing domestically and the world economy picking up uh, that those figures should improve. Uh, but uh, anyone who imagines that uh, all of Australia's economic challenges are behind it uh, would be wrong. Uh, we have significant economic challenges. Uh, add to that the world oil price, uh, rising interest rates uh, around the world, Mr Speaker, and it's going to take quite considerable economic management uh, in Australia over the next year or two. And in particular, it's going to take considerable consistent economic management. Running the Australian economy is not like running a municipal council, Mr Speaker. It takes, uh, it takes uh, a considerable skill. And, uh, one has to have uh, sophistication in relation to economic management, and uh, the thought that a failure uh, in running a local council could somehow qualify one for running a national economy uh, is, uh, is uh, spectacularly false, Mr Speaker. Uh, it is a difficult business. It does require consistency, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's not the kind of thing, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, one can pick up from uh, political advisers' books or uh, the latest download in relation to uh, Google, Mr Speaker. It's something that takes uh, disciplined economic management, and the people of Australia require that disciplined economic management because the future of their jobs and their businesses rely upon it. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, why has it taken opposition senators just one day of Senate hearings to uncover multiple tasks relating to prisoner abuse allegations performed by at least six Australian defence lawyers in Iraq between August last year and February this year, including liaising between the Americans and the International Committee of the Red Cross 
to stop the prison abuse at Abu Ghraib, given he says none of this was known by the government. Prime Minister, hasn't the government gone so far as to remove a photo of Major O'Kane at work at Abu Ghraib prison from the Defence Department website? Member for Hotham, members on my right, members on my left, the Prime Minister. In questions about removing things from the website, do I, Mr. Speaker? Do I, do I hear correctly, Mr. Speaker? I understand that matter was dealt with in the Senate estimates yesterday, and it's a matter entirely within the control of the Defence Department. The member for Hotham, member for Melbourne, the honourable member for La Trobe. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, without notice, is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Uh, would the minister update the House on how Australian families have benefited? from government support for private health insurance. Is the minister aware of any alternative policies? The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank uh, the member for La Trobe for yet another one of his many excellent questions uh, in this House. Uh, and Mr Speaker, I, uh, I certainly can inform, uh, I can, I can inform the member for La Trobe and other members uh, uh, that this government strongly believes that you can't have good public hospitals unless you have good private hospitals as well, and you won't have a strong Medicare system unless you also have a strong private health insurance system uh, to back it up. And Mr. Speaker, thanks to the policies of the Howard government, private health insurance rates have gone from 30 per cent and falling to 43 per cent and stable. Thanks to the Howard government's policies, there are now nine million people. There are now nine million people who enjoy the security and choice that private health insurance brings. And Mr. Speaker, these nine million people, they know where the Howard government stands. They know where the government stands, and they're now entitled to know where the Australian Labor Party stands and whether the Australian Labor Party is going to rip the guts out of the private health insurance rebate and take away from them the $800 a year on average that they gain Member thanks for to Bass. the private health insurance rebate. Mr Speaker, lest anyone think uh, that these are all uh, rich people, Mr Speaker, let the, let the member for Lawler understand that there are one million Australians, one mil million Australians earning less than $20,000 a year. Uh, who have private health insurance, and they, and they need to know where the Australian Labor Party stands. Mr Speaker, I'm quoting, uh, I'm quoting uh, uh, Mr Ahmed Murad uh, uh, of Enmore, who says, uh, please keep the 30 per cent rebate. As if it is removed, private health insurance will be out of reach. Uh, and Mr Speaker, I'm sure he was just speaking on behalf of the 37 per cent of people in Graindler who have private health insurance. Uh, I'm quoting Mr Alan Cassians. Uh, of Wyndham Vale, who says, and I quote, the 30% the 30, the 30 rebate makes it possible for retirees to afford the best possible medical care when ageing bodies really need it. And Mr Speaker, uh, he was one of the 30% of people in the electorate of Lawler uh, with private health insurance. Uh, I, I'm quoting now Mr Speaker John Davey of Canberra, who said, should the rebate be discontinued, we would not be able to afford to pay the extra 30% as we are low-income earners, and he's one of the 53 per cent of people in Canberra with private health insurance. Well, Mr. Speaker, these people need to know where the Labor Party stands. And you'd think that if the Labor Party really did support private health insurance, they just say so. They just say so. They they put these people out of their suspense and just say so. But, Mr. Speaker, I am sure that the true view that the true view of the opposition was expressed by the member for Werriwa back in the days when he believed that expounding policy was as important as reading stories to school children, Mr. Speaker. Let me read, if I may, yeah, Mr. Speaker, too, if I could read for a moment uh, to the member for Werriwa something uh, from a book, from a book from the Hansard of 1997, talking about the private health insurance rebate. He said, and I quote, 
This is the maddest piece of public policy that one will ever see out of the Commonwealth Parliament. This is a first-rate absurdity. So that's what the Leader of the Opposition thinks uh, about the private health insurance rebate. And Mr Speaker, let me say something, if I could, uh, through you to the Leader of the Opposition. There is more to being the alternative Prime Minister of this country than reading stories to school kids, Mr Speaker. It's also about producing policies that the adults of this country can read and understand for themselves. Mr Speaker, let me just, uh, let me, if I may, remind you uh, that what was the sole contribution to public policy debate of the alternative Prime Minister of this country yesterday. His sole contribution was standing up and reading aloud something called where is the green sheep? That was what the alternative Prime Minister of this country was doing yesterday. Where is the green sheep? I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't work out, Mr Speaker, whether this was a coded, a coded message to Senator Bob Brown, Mr Speaker, or a subtle appeal to the environmentalists of New Zealand. But Mr Speaker, it's high time, it's high time that he grew up, Mr Speaker. It's high time that he got serious. It's high time that he told people where he stands on private health insurance because, Mr Speaker, if he doesn't make it clear, people will get the message, a very clear message. If there's ever a Labor government, you will pay more for your health. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Griffith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer to the February 2004 report, the Red Cross report, which states in its first paragraph that the report deals with, and I quote, a number of serious violations of international humanitarian law, and these violations have been documented and sometimes observed while visiting prisoners of war in Iraq between March and November 2003. Will the Prime Minister confirm to the Parliament when it was in May this year that the Prime Minister's office or his department first received this February 2004 report, and if the Prime Minister, if the Prime Minister doesn't have, if the Prime Minister doesn't have that date readily at hand, would he please consult with his advisers and inform the House before he departs the United States? The Honourable the Prime Minister. For, um, having heard the Honourable gentleman's question, I will seek advice. The Honourable Member for McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Would the Minister inform the House Order. how small businesses have benefited member for Marino, from— our Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Member for McPherson will commence her question again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Would the Minister inform the House how small businesses have benefited from workplace relations reform? Are there any threats to these reforms? The, Minister for, the Honourable the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, McPherson for her question and her interest in the conditions under which small business can thrive both in her electorate and throughout Australia. Uh, Mr Speaker, since this government uh, came to office, we've seen record growth in labour productivity. We've seen a record number Member of jobs Hasler. created, something like 1.3 million extra jobs in this country. We've seen sustainable increases in real wages for employees. We've seen record low interest rates and record low industrial disputes. Now, Mr. Speaker, this didn't just happen by accident. It happened because of the careful management of the Australian economy by this government, and it also happened because of the development of flexible labour market conditions throughout Australia. Uh, other matters, might, Mr Speaker, uh, such as reforming the capital gains tax uh, system in this country, cutting personal tax thresholds, all of these measures taken by this government have led to more jobs and better conditions under which small business can thrive in this country. But the honourable member for McPherson asked me, are there threats or risks to these conditions? And indeed, Mr Speaker, there are. Uh, just yesterday, Mr Speaker, it was reported in the Australian newspaper uh, that the member for Fremantle, the president of the Australian Labor Party, uh, is reported to have told a business group behind closed doors that there would 
only be modest changes to the workplace relations structure under a Labor government. Well, Mr. Speaker, some of these, some of these so-called modest changes, including regulating independent contractors, uh, increasing union power by giving the union bosses a foot in the door of every workplace in Australia, forcing businesses to negotiate with the union bosses whether employers or employees want to or not, removing the secondary boycott provisions from the Trade Practices Act, increasing the powers of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission to intervene in the workplace, abolishing junior wage rates and increasing the regulation of workplace bargaining, so-called modest increases, according to the member for Fremantle. Mr Speaker, in addition to this, it's the Labor Party's policy to abolish the individual employment arrangements under Australian workplace agreements. Currently, Mr Speaker, some 16 per cent of federal agreements in Australia are the individual Australian workplace agreements, and on average people on Australian workplace agreements are earning some 23 per cent more than if they were covered by a certified agreement. Now, Mr Speaker, on, on top of these so-called modest uh, changes, uh, indeed a massive re-regulation of the workforce in Australia, we learn some more about what the Labor Party uh, policy is for business and small business in particular in an article in the Australian Financial Review today. And I quote, the spokesman uh, for the Labor Party, that is, the spokesman said employees should not be dependent on the size of their employer's business or on whether they are casual or permanent to be entitled to redundancy payments. Mr Speaker, what this is saying, what the Australian Labor Party is proposing, what a spokesman has reported in the Australian Financial Review today is saying that redundancy payments and redundancy conditions would be extended to casual employees in Australia. So, Mr Speaker, not only have we got a situation that small business is facing now where the Australian Labor Party is standing in the way of our proposals to change the redundancy system for small business, what the Labor Party want to do is to go further than that, and they want to extend the casual, the redundancy provisions and the casual and the provisions in relation to redundancy for payments Burke. to casual employees as well as permanent employees. No, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, that the member for Brand, the former, the former leader of the opposition, uh, said famously once on radio in Perth that the Australian Labor Party is not the party of small business. Too right. They are not the party of small business. These are more proposals which are, which are slipping out uh, from Labor Party spokespeople and what's said behind closed doors about the massive re-regulation that the Australian Labor Party would engage in if they were ever elected to government. What it shows once again, Mr Speaker, that there is a, a yawning gulf between what, what the Labor Party is saying behind closed doors in some instances, talking about a so-called modest changes to workplace relations and the reality which would be a massive re-regulation to the detriment of small businesses in this country and to the detriment of the creation of Further jobs. The Honourable Member for Lilly. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, without notice, is directed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister now aware of evidence provided to Senate estimates yesterday confirming families who lodge tax returns early will not be advised of family benefit debt clawbacks until after September? Oh. Prime Minister, is this a rerun of what the government did in 2001? when it delayed telling families of debts until after the election. Prime Minister, given that these 150,000 families— Order. Member for Lily He thinks it's funny, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Order. He it's clever, How he the member, member for Blair— the, order. the member for Lily has the call. He's being interrupted by members on both sides. The member for Lily. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Given that these 150,000 families will be kept in the dark about their debts, will the Prime Minister ensure that the proposed $20 million advertising campaign for families, scheduled for June and July, will advise those families that the second $600 payment may be clawed back against any debt the family has? The Treasurer. Uh, 
Member for Lilly has asked his question. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, Mr Speaker, I welcome the uh, question from the member for Lilly and member the answer for is luck. no. Uh, can I go on, Mr uh, Speaker, and uh, say that up until uh, yesterday I thought the complaint of the member for Lilly yes. was that uh, the additional second $600 would be used to offset debts. Uh, yesterday he changed his tact and he complained that it would not be used to <laughs> offset debt, Mr Speaker. Um, he can make one complaint or the other, but he can't make both. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, we, we force him to his election. Can I say, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, as the government has announced, every family, every family Mr Speaker, that is eligible for family tax benefit will be receiving an additional $600 per annum. And, Mr Speaker, that is not just in respect of this financial year ending 2004, but a payment before the end of this financial year in the month of June. And the undeniable fact as a consequence of that, no matter how much he twists and turns, no matter how much, Mr Speaker, he changes his ground, no matter how much, Mr Speaker, he tries to try and get these questions going, the undeniable fact of that, Mr Speaker, is under the coalition government, families eligible for family tax benefit A will receive an additional $600 per child per annum. And, Mr Speaker, they will get that for a payment before 30 June and they will have an entitlement after Member the 30th of Kingston. June. Now, Mr Speaker, I also uh, make the point, as we have on numbers of occasions, that uh, under the Australian Labor Party, although you got far less, far less in family allowance, those people that had received overpayments had to make that good. The only difference in the current scheme from the way in which the Australian Labor Party administered is that if you have an overpayment, you have to make it good, but if you have an underpayment, you are entitled to a top-up. Something? No, it's a top-up. It actually, it actually, it actually turns out, Mr. Speaker, to be more money, to be more money, and it turns out to be more money, which the Australian Labor Party never allowed them, not in 13 years. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, we think that uh, actually that's fair to the person concerned and fair to the taxpayer. Because the one thing I've not heard the uh, member for Lilly say in all of this debate, and I would be interested if he did say, is that if you received an overpayment, you shouldn't have to make that good. Because, Mr Speaker, if the Australian Labor Party's view is that by understating your income and receiving an overpayment that you wouldn't have to make that good, then the taxpayers of Australia would have to make that good. And I don't think that would be fair on the taxpayers of Australia, Mr Speaker. I don't think that would be fair on the taxpayers of Australia. These are very generous benefits, Mr Speaker, and the benefits to which people are entitled should be paid. And if during the year they have been underpaid, they should be entitled to a top-up. If during the year there has been an overpayment, Mr Speaker, then, of course, that can be set off against additional entitlements, including the $600. That is fair to the person concerned, and it is fair to the taxpayers of Australia. And, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the one undeniable fact in that fair system is, under the coalition, they will be receiving more money than they ever did under the Australian Labor Party, point one. And point two, that increase is at risk because the one assurance we have not had from the Australian Labor Party is that if they are elected, those payments will stay. And the member for Fraser has made it entirely clear, Mr Speaker, that the Australian Labor Party will not guarantee beyond 2004-2005 those payments. And so the families of Australia ought to know this and they ought to understand it. Those increased family benefits are only guaranteed under the Liberal and National parties and are at threat and at risk from the Australian Labor Party. General Member for MacArthur. Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Is the Minister aware of any proposals that would increase the price of electricity for Australian families and businesses 
And what, and what is the government's response to these possible proposals? The Minister for Environment, the Honourable Minister for Environment and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for MacArthur for his question, and I know his very strong commitment to the families in the electorate of MacArthur. I am aware, Mr. Speaker, of proposals that would increase the price of electricity for every Australian household and business, and those proposals are coming from the leader of the opposition. Uh, large increases in electricity prices are the inevitable consequence of the Leader of the Opposition's policy to ratify the Kyoto Protocol and establish a national emissions trading system. The Leader of the Opposition Mr. Speaker, used to claim to understand the impact of increased electricity prices on business and jobs. And I recall that when he was campaigning in the by-election for the seat of Cunningham, he condemned this policy as extremist. And it's just as uh, well to remind ourselves of what the Leader of the Opposition said at that time. He said, well, it's green policy to reduce greenhouse gases by 60 per cent, and, Tony, that has massive consequences for jobs. If you implement their policy, you lose many, many thousands of jobs, and you couldn't reduce greenhouse gases by that amount without literally closing down BHP in Wollongong, and that would be an absolute disaster for regional policy. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, Bob Brown's policy is now the policy of the Australian Labor Party, and the, la the Leader of the Opposition has reneged on his commitment to preserve jobs. In fact, what is now clear is that the Leader of the Opposition is prepared to trade jobs for preferences. Uh, this is shaping up as one of the grubbiest political deals that we have seen for many, many years. The Allen Consulting Report, which was commissioned by the Leader of the Opposition's mates in Victoria, showed that emissions trading could cost up to 15,000 jobs and put up the price of electricity by about 27 per cent. The member now, 15,000 jobs, a 27 per cent increase in electricity prices. Uh, this, Mr Speaker, is going to have a devastating impact on Australian communities and families. Let me make the point very clearly, Mr Speaker. Australia does not need to go down this job-destroying path. It's a costly path. It's going to destroy jobs around the country. We are going to reach our internationally agreed target for greenhouse gas abatement without imposing unnecessary costs on households and businesses. But you have to wonder whether the Leader of the Opposition really understands what he's saying or whether he means what he's saying. Members may remember that he actually went to Gladstone in March to announce this job-destroying policy, this emissions trading policy, and he told the people in Gladstone that it would be good for jobs. It was a policy that would actually destroy jobs in Gladstone. It would devastate that town, as the member for Hinkler knows only too well. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition seems to believe that high costs are good for jobs. He seems to believe that higher costs make us more competitive. He seems to believe it's good for Australian families to have their electricity bills put up by $200 to $300 a year. Well, Mr Speaker, anyone who believes these things would believe anything. As Mr, Mr. Speaker, as Alan Wood wrote in The Australian this morning, if Mark Latham cares about jobs, he should reconsider his simple-minded support of ratification of Kyoto. Mr Speaker, Mark Latham hasn't become more environmental. He hasn't become greener. He's just been browned by the leader of the Greens. And Australian families and workers, Australian families and workers are going to pay the price in lost jobs and higher electricity prices for the preferences he thinks he's buying. Minister for the Minister for the Order, member for Parau resume his seat. The Minister for the Environment and Heritage will refer to the Leader of the Opposition by his title. What did he call him? Member for Parau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Order. 
Member for Karaya, Member for Karaya will resume his seat. Treasurer, members on my right, the member for Karaya has the call. Member for Karaya. Minister for uh, Member for Karaya. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Is the Minister aware that today is National Apple and Pear Day? Is the Minister also aware that the growers have organised protests against the government's draft import risk assessment, which would allow apples to be imported into Australia from New Zealand and expose the Australian industry to the threat of fire blight? Will the Minister now admit that under his stewardship, there has been a loss of confidence among growers in the government's import risk assessment Karaya, process, come to his question. and will the minister now follow Labor's lead and restore the integrity of the import risk assessment process by committing to a process that is based on science and science alone? <laughs> Member for Fisher. I deliberately didn't raise this matter in the presence of the New Zealand Speaker for reasons that parliamentarians will understand. But if any parliamentarian refers to House of Reps practice, the guide for the parliament, of course, on page 159, they will find reference to food and refreshments being brought into the chamber and the Speaker's reaction. I am not standing here being pedantic about this so-called protest. I am standing here because when first this was mooted, the staff, of, the staff of this chamber specifically asked the member for Franklin not to proceed with the matter, and in defiance of the chair, he did so. The member for Franklin will apologise to the chair. The member for Prospect is warned. The member for Franklin. So Mr. Mr. Speaker, Member at, for Franklin. Mr. Speaker, as today is National Apple and Member Pear Day, Franklin. and as I proudly represent one of the five seats in the Apple Isle, yeah. I symbolically placed a pink lady on the desk of each of my colleagues prior to question time. You, Mr. Speaker, had these apples returned to my office, and I was told that you had asked them to be removed. I brought in one apple and placed it on my desk, and I thought this was appropriate on this National Apple and Pear Day. And I honestly believe that I have nothing to apologise for. The member for Franklin had specific instructions from my office. He will apologise or I will deal with him. The member for Franklin had specific instructions for which he also had individual responsibility. Member for Franklin. Mr Speaker, the apples were returned to my office. I had no instruction. That the attendant presented me with a half case of apples and I was told that you had asked them to be removed. I had no other further instruction. And as I said, I brought this apple in individually and placed it on my desk, and I don't think I have anything to apologise for. The Honourable, I will recognise the leader of the opposition when his own when his own members exercise the courtesy of allowing to be heard. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'd just appeal to you to show some leniency in this matter, given that the apples are not being used as food. They're not being eaten in the chamber. Um, the member comes from the Apple Isle, as we know it so proudly. Uh, I don't feel that the House is being brought into disrepute, that its reputation will be damaged in any way, and I just ask you to take those thoughts into account as you deal with the matter. The member for McKellar will resume her seat. Let me indicate to the Leader of the Opposition I understand the spirit of his intervention, but let me also point out to him that I have already exercised a great deal of leniency in my dealings with the member for Franklin, 
I take his word that there was no specific instruction that meant that the other apples came into the chamber, but equally, in defiance of what I specifically instructed, he chose to bring apples, an apple into the chamber, and I have asked him, in a lenient act on the part of the chair, to apologise. His failure to do so will leave me with no choice. The member for Franklin. The member for Franklin. Mr. Mr Speaker, I have nothing further to add. Then I name the member for Franklin. <laughs> Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that the member be suspended from the service of the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the member for Flinders be that the member for Franklin be suspended from the service of the House. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tellers for the eyes, honourable members for Melbourne Ports and Franklin tellers for the nose. Remind the member for Ballarat that suspending orders are not suspended during a division. Order. The result of the division is eyes 80, no 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The member is suspended for understanding order 303 for 24 hours. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And whilst members may have now forgotten the question asked by the honourable member for Corio, the answer. Uh, the minister the, has the call. The answer to the first question is yes. I am. I am aware that today is the National Apple and Pear Day. In fact, yesterday, yesterday, I issued a press release encouraging all Australians to eat an apple or a pear today because it was not only good for their health. But it's also good for our country. Now, the answer Member to the second Brisbane. part of the honourable member's question, where he attempted to allude that Labor was supportive of a science-based quarantine system, leaves me somewhat puzzled because that's opposite to what the member for Corio said when he was speaking on Radio 2AY uh, just a couple of days ago. Because on 2AY he actually said that, uh, that uh, urged me to ignore the scientists in dealing with IRA and suggested that I should take the advice of a, of a committee of politicians on that matter. A committee Order. of politicians. So is Labor in favour of a science-based system or isn't, it, or isn't it? Does the member for Corio in backing science Minister. today, two days ago in radio, he wanted politicians to make the decision? Now, Mr Speaker, at the meeting of agriculture ministers in Adelaide uh, just uh, last, uh, last week, uh, ministers agreed unanimously. Ministers agreed unanimously, and this included the Labor state ministers, that decisions in relation to import risk assessments need to be based on science. They also, they also in a joint communique, emphasised the importance 
of, of, of respecting the professionalism of the scientists involved in the IRA process. They re reaffirmed the importance of scientific independence in the biosecurity process. Now, Mr. Speaker, in relation to apples, the uh, Biosecurity Australia appointed a panel of leading experts to oversee an assessment of the scientific issues associated with the import of apples from New Zealand. They have issued an interim report, which is now open for public consultation. Uh, the public now has an, any opportunity they choose to raise scientific issues of concern until about the 23rd of June, uh, when the, uh, th that consultation period closes. After that, the scientific issues will again be assessed. This government is committed to import risk assessments based on science. We have an obligation under the, under the World Trade Organisation to deal with issues in that regard. We export two-thirds of all the agricultural products that we produce. We want other countries to have a science-based quarantine system, and that's what we intend to deliver also for Australia. The, the other element of the hypocrisy of Labor in relation to this matter is when we look back to their days in office. Yeah. Not only did they not have an open and transparent import risk assessment process, but once the arrangements were in place, they had so few quarantine officers that there was nobody at the border to inspect the product anyhow. Uh, under this government, there has been a major upgrading, $600 million commitment to ensure that we keep I our borders safe McMillan. and secure. Our process will be based on sound science, and, uh, and, and if perchance at some stage in the future uh, apples are allowed in from another part of the world, it will be under conditions that are safe and secure. And I've got every confidence that high quality Australian pink lady pass. apples will be able to compete with any product that comes into this country. I've got more confidence in this industry than it's obvious that Labor has. Prime Minister. Prime Minister.